Okay, Sarah, I think if um, we're going to kick off, there's um, quite a few people have joined already, which is great. So it's just after 11 o'clock with me. So I think we're going to head on. Um, but if I, before Sarah um, kicks off, um, just as a very quick introduction, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us um, today. Um, we have the amazing Sarah Dagnan uh, presenting. Uh, Sarah is STR's Director of Client Relationships and is based in London. Um, really doesn't need any introduction, to be honest. Um, I think most of you know her. Um, she's a great personality in the hospitality industry. Um, but Sarah has a, has a great background. She joined the Hotel Benchmark team at Deloitte in 2005 as business development executive, later becoming the account manager. Sarah is a regular speaker, presents at lots of hotel and industry events um, and spreads great awareness of STR's benchmarking services. She is uh, very experienced in hotel operations in Ireland and holds an honours degree in translation, German and Spanish. We're not going to ask you to speak in German or Spanish today, Sarah. Um, but listen, thank you so much. I know that you're a very, very busy lady. Um, so thank you so much for giving us your time today. And I'm just going to hand straight over to you, if that's okay. That's perfect. Thanks, Adrian. Um, Adrian, sound okay? Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Um, Adrian, not many things make me nervous, but you describe me in such glowing terms. Uh, <laughs> means I have a lot to live up to now. So thank you for that very glowing well, it's the um, truth. introduction. It's the truth, Sarah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so guys, my kind of role today is just to take you through kind of how, what we're seeing in the industry um, across a little bit on the world, across um, Europe. We'll drill down into the UK, um, into Ireland. I'll touch on some of the, some of the key um, locations, cities um, in Europe also. We try to tailor this based on kind of registrations and, and where you all sit and, and took that as an assumption of where your interests would lie um, when it comes to what market you'd like to have some information on. So before I kick off on that, um, and Adrian, you'll have to keep me through that the slides are moving along, just to make sure there's no IT issues. Um, so to give you just kind of a view on, on and who, what, and where STR are, so starting with the where piece, um, I'm the longest person in the international business. Um, I joined the Lloyd team, like um, Adrian said, back in 2005, like many um, expats abroad, my plan was two years, and I forgot to come home 15 years, uh, 15 years later, almost 15 years later. When I joined the business, there weren't near as many dots on this map. Um, there were about seven dots, uh, London being our headquarters um, for international and a place called Hendersonville in Tennessee in the US, um, our global um, headquarters or corporate office, if you will, um, along with an office in Asia Pacific and a couple scattered around, um, was long as I, sorry, in Singapore and scattered around Asia Pacific. So huge growth in the last kind of 15 years I've been in the business um, for STR. And more recently, uh, new owners in the form of CoStar um, almost nine weeks ago now. So what we do, predominantly what we do is our bread and butter is the bottom left-hand corner. So we collect um, available rooms, sold rooms, excluding complimentary and house use, and net rooms, revenue, excluding VAT, service charge, taxes, food and beverage, et cetera, on a nightly basis. So that's kind of the performance reports, and we compute then the occupancy, the average daily rate, and the revenue per available room. There are many other facets to the business, Supply reports looking at what's existing supply in any given market around the world, um, future supplies so in terms of pipeline. Uh, we do then forecast also for about 82 different markets um, around the world. Many of those um, are international outside North America, and we have quite an extensive research and analysis team also. So we started collecting data um, exactly 34 years ago, it was in June. Um, the certainly data collection has evolved significantly and literally on a daily, almost on an hourly basis, more and more hotels provide us with their data. But as it currently stands, it's just over 66,000, actually almost 67,000 um, hotel customers globally that provide us with their available rooms, sold rooms, and net rooms revenue on a nightly basis. That equates to just shy of uh, 9 million rooms and allows us to report in 180 countries around the world. So we look at the breakdown of those countries or those, sorry, geographic areas. Uh, if we start with that first, the biggest um, bulk of that is in North America. So 37,700 um, hotels in North America. And a fun fact is if you look at the big international American operators, so the likes of Hilton, Marriott, um, Hyatt, Choice, and if you, if you throw Accor in there for good measure, once we've collected the data in North America for them top 10 American operators, that represents 87% of all hotels in North America. If we look at that, those same 10 operators outside of North America, it's 
I think it's fair to say that the international landscape is a very different beast to the North American uh, landscape. So certainly lots of growth happening, especially in Europe, Asia Pacific, and then in the lesser developed markets like Africa, um, the Middle East, and down into Central and South America. So we get into the nitty gritty of the stats and the performance, the hotel performance data. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag when you look at, um, at the globe as it currently um, stands for, for hotels and how they're performing. This is the rev per percentage change. Most of the data that I'll show you today is year to date, October 2019, it's by comparison to the same period 2018. So there's kind of three key things that we see affecting the world in its entirety at the moment. You don't often have three common, um, common kind of uh, demand, demand factors um, impacting the entire world. One big factor that we've seen is an increase in new supply, and in some cases, an unprecedented increase in new supply across the entire geographic world. So it's no longer just the pockets of the Middle East or Asia Pacific. We're seeing quite hefty increase in supply in places like North America. So North America, traditionally, you would have had what we would very least describe as organic growth. So the organic brands, the, the localized American brands, the Hiltons, the Marriott's, the, the aforementioned um, hotel companies I mentioned earlier. Um, but now we're seeing a lot more of the European brands, the likes of NH, the likes of Melia, and indeed Accor increasing their, fo their footprint in North America. So we've not really seen, of course, the domestic brand is still growing, uh, but we've not seen a huge amount of kind of the, the European brands going into North America. So that's certainly a shift. Uh, if you look there at the Middle East, that negative 5.3% is pretty much entirely down to significant new supply going in there. I'll tell you about one such project is a 10,000 bedroom hotel going into Mecca, uh, which will be quite the beast, and another one, um, an 11,000 bedroom hotel due to open tail end 2021 into 2022. So we're glad you're not managing any of those. Same story in Asia and Australia and Oceania. So where we've seen relatively muted new supply going in over the last several years, and that's really starting to, um, to ramp up in those locations. The second kind of common theme that we're having is political uncertainty. So of course, um, in the UK, the big question currently, well, the big a talking point currently is the uh, nonsense elections um, in tandem with, uh, with Brexit, if it ever happens. Um, but of course, that's political uncertainty all around the world. Next year in North America will be an um, election year there, or sorry, North, North America in the US will be an election year in the US. And there's a lot of political uncertainty still in the Middle East and to a degree as well in Asia. And then the third piece, which may not originally come to mind, is the whole trade war between the US and China. And whilst that might not affect us in a huge way, if you think about the amount of goods that come in from China um, into Europe and into the Middle East, into Asia Pacific and all around the world, the fact that there's a trade war could in the long or medium to long term affect all of us. Just kind of three key things that we're seeing across the world. So if we talk a little bit about demand and supply growth um, or decline as it, as it um, occasionally is. I always talk about, many of you will have heard me say this before, about the equilibrium um, between demand and supply and often the inverted or um, the equilibrium being the wrong way around. So ideally when it comes to demand and supply, what you want to see is you want to see supply growing or demand growing at a similar pace to supply. So if it's the same, if it's 2% demand growth and 2% supply growth, that's okay. Because that means that we are building hotel rooms and demand is increasing at the same pace as supply growth to fill those hotel rooms. In an even better scenario, you would see demand growing maybe a little bit faster, a little bit ahead of supply. So it gives uh, reasonably good um, fundamentals for a strong performance when it comes to occupancy average rate and rev per. What you don't want to see is what we see on this slide here, what we see in the, the, um, the boxed out locations. So the North American, Caribbean, the Central America piece, and also the Asian, Australian, Oceania. And that's when supply is growing at a faster pace than demand. So essentially meaning we're um, building new hotel rooms, whether it's extensions to existing properties or whether it's brand new hotels. And we, are not, we don't quite have an equal demand to fill those hotel rooms, which often has a negative consequence, at least in the short term, sometimes uh, into the medium or long term, but a negative consequence for occupancy average rate and or rev par. Um, if we look at ourselves here in Europe, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in a moment. The equilibrium is just about the right way around. So Europe growing for the 10 months 2019 by 1.7% on demand and 1.4% on supply. So we drill down to Europe in a little bit more detail. Just look at Europe over a slightly longer time series. So looking back from 2012, so you'll see from 2012 to 2017 ish, the year over year, there was less than 1% new supply coming into the Europe market. 
So as new properties opened, it was overall over the entire of the Europe region, it was less than 1%. That ramped up a little bit in 2018 and further again in 2019. We expect 19 to finish somewhere around 1.5% to 1.6% supply growth. And whilst that might seem like a huge amount, if you equate that back to 13 or 14, it's pretty much double the pace of what we've seen back um, four to five years ago. So that's certainly um, impact impacting some of the performance across Europe. And this is Europe as it's in its entirety. We'll drill down in just a moment. If we overlay that supply growth and look at the demand and the rev per percentage change, the fundamentals back in 2013, 14, 15 were really strong. So we had strong demand coming into the marketplace, a bit of a wobble in 2016. That's when you will have read in the press or heard in the press or on the news. There was a whole discussion around, um, is it going to be a double digit um, drop? Are we going into recession again? Thankfully that didn't happen. It did depress rev per but it did not go into negative territory. So it still stayed in positive territory. We had the bounce back then in 17, 18, and then into 19, um, we're sitting in a reasonably good place and looking at about 2.5% rev per growth year over year. Look at that, a slightly longer time series. And this is just to kind of bring us back to the, um, I know not many people want to visit the 2008, 2009 performance, but just to kind of remember where we were in 2008 and 2009 to really kind of focus on where we've come from and where we are now. So remember, we, we, the European market dropped by 13.5% rev per um, decline back in 2008, 9, 10. Again, different locations in different countries and cities sat in slightly different um, places. We then had a period of, it's not all growth, it's probably not fair to say, but certainly recovery and growth. The wobble then, like I said, in 2016, where we're sitting now uh, with a 2.5% year to date, 2019. So if we look at some of the contributing um, uh, we look at what the contribution is of occupancy and AGR stat performance over the last almost four years. So we'll see back in 2017 into the early part of 18, there's a pretty even contribution of occupancy and average rate, maybe slightly more on the average rate side of things as we go month by month. Um, certainly ramped up average rate growth um, uh, through, 2000, through the latter part of 2018 into the earlier part of 2019. We have started to see occupancy growth slow down as we get into kind of the tail end midway through and kind of the tail end 2019, but average rate is still growing, is still reasonably strong, but it is um, also starting to slow down um, as we get towards the end of the year. In saying that though, if we compare where we are in 2018 and 19, so that little kind of uh, light colored blue C, if you like, um, is 2017's occupants performance. The lighter of the blue lines is 2018, the darker is year to date 2019. Europe is a full 10 percentage points, and in some cases close to 12 percentage points, um, higher than it was back in 2007. So despite all of the new supply that's come into the marketplace, we've still managed to grow occupancy across the board, irrespective of what month we're looking at by a full 10 percentage points. If we look at Europe then, just year to date, what the, the three KPIs are telling us, so 73.3% of all rooms were sold in Europe for the first 10 months of this year. That's a marginal increase of 0.3% on last year. We were sold for an average of 114 and a half euros and just shy of 84 euros on rev per. So most of the growth sitting in average rate. We just drill that down a little bit further into transient and group rev per percentage change. So you'll see we have started to see a slowdown in group, um, in group rev per and also in group demand coming into Europe. Now we expect that to continue into next year, especially if you break that down even further and look at um, US visitors coming into Europe. Like I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, next year is an election year in the US, and that tends, you know, history, history has taught us that, that tends, um, ten, we tend to see then a slowdown um, in US inbound travel or, or outbound travel, depending on which way you look at it, outbound to the US during an election year. So expect that group um, to certainly be flat or maybe a little bit down into 2020 as well. Transient, though, is more than making up for that decline. The transient growing at 3.8%. Um, year state 19 versus year state 18, so more than making up the shortfall of the group demand. If we drill down then and look at some of the um, kind of key markets, by no means all of the markets that we report on across Europe, but just some of the key markets across Europe. Paris stands tall, so heading towards 220 euros average rate. The blue dots are occupancy pertaining to the left, red and green. Average rate and rev per respectively pertaining to the right hand side of your screen. Power stands tall, like I said, 220 euros, just shy of 220 euros average rate. Caveat to that comment is that um, 
a large part of our participating hotels in Paris are higher end hotels, kind of four and five star hotels, although that has started to shift this year where we have many more of the budget and economy hotels. Um, Zurich is following reasonably close behind, so just under the 200 euro mark on average rate. Zurich is a little bit um, of currency shift because all of this performance is in euros. And uh, since, uh, since Switzerland unpegged against the euro, you're seeing a little bit of a sway on currency. Dublin is, I can finally say, number one at some things, just shy of 85% occupancy in Dublin for the 10 months to October. We're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. Followed less than half percentage point behind by London's so exceptionally robust performance in London. Again, we'll look at that in more detail in just a few moments. You can then book at the likes of Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin. So Amsterdam, Berlin, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, um, sitting at about 130 euros average rate. And then if we look at Brussels, probably the only market in the whole of Europe that is delighted that Brexit has not happened yet, um, given that all of our politicians are uh, spending significant periods of time in Brussels um, at the moment. If we look though, if it's a better or worse picture than last year, and it's a bit of a mixed bag depending on where you're looking at. So if we pull out some of the, some of the more, um, more challenging markets at the moment, Moscow is certainly challenged at the minute, down 24% on last year. Although most of you remember last year, Russia hosted the um, World Cup. So that's just an, adjust, or a, a, an adjustment on not having the World Cup this year. The positive flip on that is that St. Petersburg has actually grown by 3%. Didn't host as many matches as Moscow did. But the fact that they've grown the year after a World Cup is a, is a no mean feat. Istanbul is still in recovery mode, some from a lot of the political unrest um, in Turkey. But we have started to see some airlift go back into into Turkey and of course airlift has gone into Istanbul or they've never stopped but certainly into places like Sharm el Sheikh and Hurghada where, where that certainly did stop. If we move into the Mediterranean then Barcelona is growing at 13%. Uh, Barcelona for the last almost three years has had a moratorium on new supply so that was lifted I think about six or eight weeks ago now so where they couldn't build any new supply either extensions to um, existing properties or any brand new uh, brand new properties in cities that that may shift a little bit as and that's been opened up again and Madrid is certainly a testament to uh, an ability to grow especially on the back of uh, more corporate business coming in but as well having hosted uh, the UEFA Champions League finals did a fantastic job of that earlier in the year. Some of the markets then evolving um, really kind of putting themselves out there in the world stage places like Budapest, Prague, Vienna certainly this time of year uh, with the Christmas market demand coming in doing exceptionally well. Amsterdam down a little bit, a little bit less events um, going into the Amsterdam market this year. And Verso, um, a huge amount of new supply going in. So especially on the higher end of things, uh, excuse me, on the branded end of things, should I say, not the higher end of things. Um, you know, the likes of uh, Marriott bringing in their Moxie brands. So where it used to be much more traditional family run properties, you're seeing a lot more of the international operators going into the, into the uh, Verso market, into the Polish market in general. So you move on a little bit just to the UK and look at the UK in a little bit more detail. We're going to drill down a little bit on the UK. So if we look at the UK in its entirety, first of all, again, going back, uh, we're looking here at just shy of an eight-year time series. So looking at the supply, the demand, and again, the rev par. And we'll drill down into, uh, we'll take out the London impact in just a moment. So that equilibrium that I mentioned around supply and demand has shifted. So we're seeing supply now across the UK growing at a slightly faster rate than the demand to fill that or to occupy that new supply. If we look back to 2012, we'd have a very similar picture there. And 2012, you remember, was when um, Olympics were in uh, the UK or predominantly in London. Um, so we had that kind of adjustment on new supply opening in time to, in time to host the Olympic Games. We haven't really seen that. Um, we had a little bit, sorry, in 2016, but that equilibrium tends to shift what we've kind of seen is every kind of three to four years as new supply comes to fruition. If we look then over um, a slightly longer time period again, the good news about the UK is that it did not depress as far as what we saw for all Europe. So RevPAR declined by a square 10.1% it was um, back in 2008, 2009, as we went through the global financial crisis. But we have so far seen 33 consecutive months of rev par growth. So small, um, small drop um, for two months in 2016 as we have that kind of wobble. Um, but we've seen 33 months since then of growth um, right up to year state 2019. If we look then at the um, transient and groups, so similar to what we looked at for the, for the whole of Europe, it is a much more depressed picture when it comes to 
uh, the group side of things. So down four and a half percent year to date. We're expecting that to continue to drop as we get into um, November and December data. And it's not quite been um, picked up on the transient side of things. So a little over half of that is being picked up on transient to 2.6% growth on the transient side of things. So again, slow down the group demands, which is a similar pattern or trend that we saw for Europe. UK in its entirety, so 78.3% of all rooms sold, down fractionally again on last year, similar to what we saw for Europe. However, average rate growing, so heading towards £95 and £74 um, rev par for the 10 months. We look at some of the key markets, again, by no means all. No shock to anybody to see that average rate is the highest in London. Again, we look at that in more detail in just a moment. Perhaps surprising to some of you to see that Bath is the second highest. Um, average rate after London. So um, heading towards 105, almost 106 pound average rate. Across the board, really strong occupancy fundamentals, with the exception of Aberdeen, which are Aberdeen, Newcastle and Belfast, which I'll touch on in just a second. All markets for the 10 months um, so far this year have seen occupancy of 75%. So strong fundamentals when it comes to occupancy. Aberdeen is actually doing better than it has been for many years. Massive amount of new supply, not just in the hotel segment, but also in the service department segment coming in. Much of that um, supply was to be met by demand from oil workers off the coast with BP, with a huge contingent of employees off the coast. They reduced that a number of years ago, really at probably the worst time possible for Aberdeen, um, when a huge amount of that supply was still in construction. And then um, marry that up with the amount of new service department offering in Aberdeen that led to the perfect storm. So the fact that Aberdeen is achieving just over 65% occupancy is really a really strong place to be compared to where they were in previous years. Other markets doing reasonably well, and um, we see the Oxford area, the Oxford market again, third um, highest performer, kind of toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with Edinburgh, uh, if you look at the average rate there as well. Better or worse than last year, it's a pretty tough start. Um, our start are pretty tough uh, 10 months for a lot of markets. Um, Belfast has had a significant amount of new supply entering the marketplace. It's a couple of thousand new rooms going in there. Most of that is brand new stock, a couple of extensions. Um, most of that is now open, I think with the exception of one or maybe two. So now ready to, to, to bed in all that new supply. A lot of that's gone in the city centre. Um, Cardiff has had a limited new supply going in which is always surprising to me, um, although Cardiff has seen a reduction in the number of big events going in, especially sporting events um, going into that marketplace. Glasgow, again, supply-driven, um, also on the back of less um, conference going in there, so more going in, um, going into the likes of Edinburgh and Aberdeen. So that growth of 3% in Aberdeen, whilst might not sound like huge growth to any of you on the call, it is a really, really strong place for Aberdeen to be in. Uh, given that about three and a half years ago, there were negative 34% when it came to Rev Park. Southampton is um, a real success story of how to work with the cruise line industry. Southampton, a market that works, hotel market that works exceptionally well with the cruise liners that come in, um, you know, stay the night before you go on your, on your cruise, stay the night after you come back, um, so you do a really good job of that there and real high activity. Um, and then a kind of a mixed bag across the likes of Manchester, Nottingham, Leeds, um, Blackpool, it's kind of flat year over year um, as, we, as we see performance uh, continue through the end of this year, we expect that to, to remain as well. So if we look at regional UK by itself, so split, uh, take out the kind of London, what I call the London effect, and again, slightly different picture. Um, the trend is still the same when it comes to supply outgoing um, the demand. Uh, demand side of things, um, but it's also led to negative rev per percentage change for the regions. And we had seen that supply kind of toe to toe in 2018, getting close in 2017. So it's just really about how that supply is coming to fruition. We look at the performance over the last number of years then for rev par. Again, a little bit more depressed when it came to rev par um, percentage change back in 2008, 9, 10. Um, so it was this kind of square 10% when we looked at all the UK, certainly being um, underpinned a little bit by London. So close to 11, 11.5% in 2009-10. We then had a period of recovery, um, wobble then very much so in 2013. So that was on the back of having reasonable demand in even in the regions for um, Olympics. Huge growth, 14, 15, 16, then as that new supply took hold, 
as we saw less that staycationing, um, we start to see that kind of downward spiral. So we've only really seen that take hold in April and May of this year, we've started to see that, that um, the performance head into negative territory when we look at RevPAR. <coughs> Excuse me. If we look then at the transient and group contribution, you'll see that it's actually declined on both sides of things. So 4.4% down in group and, and down 1% on transient. So we can see again where, that decline, where those declines are coming in, uh, what segment of business is, um, is experiencing those declines. So year to date, 76.4% uh, of, of um, all rooms sold across the regions, 72 pounds, just over 72 pounds average rate. And that's resulting in a negative 1.3 on average rate. So it's not, it's not quite an even split, it's occupancy down marginally and then it's the pressure is on the average rate piece. If we look at London then and how London's playing out, um, London is a very different beast to the regions. It's kind of like comparing Dublin to regional Ireland or or any of the key markets maybe across, um, across Germany to the more regional markets or likewise in Switzerland, we look at Zurich um, or Geneva by comparison to any of the, the markets outside of those two locations. So it performs in a very different way. You'll see London has had several years where supply has outpaced um, the demand growth and some years fared out better than others um, when it came to RevPAR. So one could argue that some of that new supply was required. 2012, of course, is Olympic year. So we've seen um, supply far outpace um, the demand, but of course we had Olympics to uh, maintain that rev power at the 2.5%. Similar picture in 2015, although not as robust, but still in positive territory. The wobble in 2016, as um, we started talking about, was it going to be a second recession? Then the adjustment in 17, 18 and 19. So the equilibrium, the right way around, so far at least for London, so still seeing significant new supply going in, extensions to a lot of properties. We've quite a few properties under refurbishment at the moment, that again is cyclical. Um, and a lot of the, the kind of high-end hotels coming in. So places, properties like the Londoner, which is a Radisson Edwardian property, will be Sister Hotel, the Mayfair opening next year, right in the middle of Leicester Square. So a lot of crime sites um, in the middle of London, and certainly in the middle of tourist traps in London, uh, due to open, if not already this year, then into next year and uh, brands like Peninsula, et cetera, coming around Park Lane. If we look over the last then several years, London's been on quite the roller coaster. So a lot more um, volatility, um, although one would argue the adjustment then after that volatility is also greater. So the, the, the ability to be more robust, if you will. So those heady growths of 15, 16 percent, seven towards 17 percent in 2007 um, was only dropped by less than 7 percent in 2008, 9, 10. Technically speaking, London was actually only in recession for nine months. We've seen the growth then through 11 and 12, the readjustment um, on the back of Olympics in 12. So you see that readjustment in 13. And then kind of a, a bit of a mixed bag in 2017 into 18. Certainly this time last year, um, we were expecting London to decline. We'd saw some really rough performance in September. Not totally, um, totally all came back in October. Um, and into 2019, it's been reasonably strong performance across the London market. Again, if we look at the split of transient and group, group, you'll see this is the common theme throughout. Group has seen declines, 2.2% down, but more than made up of threefold, made up of and a little bit more um, on the transient side of things. So massive transient um, growth coming into the London market, pushing that rev power up. Year to date, very different pictures to the region. So marginal um, uptick in occupancy is 83.6%. Um, average rate up in very comfortable 4%, so heading towards £154 and £128.70 on RevPAR, so 4.3% growth year over year. Split London up then, just to give you a little bit of a flavour for where some of that is coming into. So we split London up into several different sub-markets. Um, no shock to see that the West End and Knightsbridge, Pimlico, Victoria sub-markets respectively have the highest average rates. So West End with a lot of the high-end five-star hotels um, just shy of £235 average rate. Now, occupancy sitting at, at um, just over 81%. And then a very, very similar picture for the Knightsbridge Pimlico Victoria, a little bit lower on the average rate and occupancy a little bit higher. It's just over 82%. But then reasonable performance um, across, the, across the city and, and really, really strong occupancy fundamentals. So pretty much all sub-markets sitting in excess of 80% occupancy year-to-date October. So let's move swiftly along to the Irish market. We'll have a look at that and what's happening there. 
So if we do a little bit of comparing and contrasting, first of all, Ireland All is the perforated blue line, uh, Regional Ireland, the navy blue, Cork, the green, Dublin, the orange, and Galway, the yellow. For anyone that tells me Ireland is not, the Irish markets are not seasonal, they just need to take one very brief glance at this, um, at this chart here to see what's, what's happening when it comes to occupancy. So exceptionally seasonal. Surprising for many that Dublin is not more diverse, that maybe you wouldn't be seeing the same peaks and troughs in Dublin, but that's not the case. Um, so very, very similar pattern when it comes to occupancy. Average rate is a similar pattern, although Dublin does trade ahead. Um, year over year uh, growth across all markets when it comes to average rate. Um, but when we look at the gap and the, the ability for that gap to continue to grow, the gap is starting to slow down. So there has been growth, but if you look back, look at the Dublin market, for example, back in 2015, in the middle of 2015, they were sitting about 120 euros, it jumped 20 euros in 2016 jumped again but by about 15 in 2017, another 15 in 2018, but more like kind of eight or nine um, euros in 2019. And similar pattern if you look at uh, the Cork market, a little more like five, six euros, uh, three, four euros, two, three euros um, year over year, Galway similar as well. Um, and the regions, uh, again, a similar picture there too. If we compare and contrast in absolute terms um, of these markets shown here, all markets have achieved at least 70% occupancy. Um, up until August of this year, Kilkenny was trading at a higher occupancy than Cork, which is not something you see that often, although Cork is back with the, what I jokingly call the premium of 48 cents, the band's in total of 48 cents. Cork did have a new opening um, last year, which certainly had a, an impact on uh, performance in the city. Um, and also a huge amount of student accommodation came online just in time for the summer months before any of the students needed it. Fun fact about Kilkenny is the, an average Saturday night in Kilkenny um, is about 172 euros average rate, whereas the, an average Saturday night in Dublin is about 162. So just shy of a 10 euro premium to stay in Kilkenny on a Saturday night by comparison to Dublin, which is quite shocking to many. Uh, but reasonable performance across, the, across the, um, the country. Better or worse than last year? Um, everybody wants to be in the top right-hand corner. Top right-hand corner where we're seeing Munster, Kilkenny and Leinster. That Munster region is essentially everything outside of Cork. Leinster region is everything outside of Dublin. Kilkenny stands alone by itself. So if you're in the top right-hand corner, you're growing occupancy and average rate. If you're in the top left-hand corner where Kerry is currently sitting, we're often asked what Kerry Regional means. It's essentially a mixture of Clarny and Tralee hotels. So if you're in the top left-hand corner, you're growing occupancy, but you're losing, excuse me, you're growing average rate, but you're uh, losing occupancy doing so. So there are less, less, uh, less customers in your rooms, um, but they're paying a slightly have higher average rate. Bottom right hand corner, you're, uh, you're uh, gaining occupancy but at a lower rate. So that's the kind of what we call the question mark corner. It's like what? You're, you're, making, more mo you're making less money um, but with more um, beds occupied. So that's where the Ireland Northwest piece sits. And the bottom left hand corner is really where nobody wants to be. It's where you're losing occupancy and average rate. Now it's nominal, so Cork is the one that has the, the most challenges. So down 2% uh, on, uh, on um, the occupancy and close to 3% on average rate, for the reasons I um, mentioned before. And Galway and Dublin also, if they see nominal new supply going into Galway and significant new supply going into Dublin, sitting at about 2,500 rooms already. We'll look at that in just a moment. Actually, we'll look at it right now. We drill down into Dublin a little piece. Look at Dublin over the years. Um, in 2014, you see a slight decline, and 15, and 16, and 17, actually, slight declines in, on, on supply. That does not necessarily mean that we had um, inventory shut down, but it does mean that we had a lot of inventory that came out for refurbishment, and we start, we've started to see that come back in 18 and indeed in 2019. So that equilibrium I mentioned earlier on, wrong way around currently. So supply growing at a, at a, um, a straight 5%, and depending on what month you're looking at, a little bit higher. But demand fundamentals really strong. So the fact that being two and a half thousand new rooms open the Dublin market, I would have expected Revpar at this stage to be much further down than where it is currently. So that's certainly the a positive view for the Dublin market with all of the new um, supply coming in, brand new brands entering the marketplace, brands like Hyatt Centric and the Liberties, Hyatt's very first property in the whole of Ireland, um, the Aloft uh, making it, uh, the Aloft and the Moxie making it Marriott's fourth and fifth brand. Um, joining the autograph collection, the Shelburne, the Western, um, in the in the marketplace as well. So five, so five, sorry, excuse me, four hotels now in the city. 
um, and also several um, Hilton, so Garden Inn, um, you know, double trees there already um, coming online as well. If we look at Dublin in a slightly different vein, so if we look at supply over the last number of, um, so kind of um, just shy of the three year period, again, you see that little bold effect in the middle, that's where supply came out of inventory. And if we look at really where that starts to take hold, it was only really in April of this year, so or the 12 months to April of this year. So that's where we see that crossover and the, the pressure really to be put on as the new supply came in and as rev power started to um, go into a downward spiral, but really only um, came in uh, late August, entering into early September, where we've seen that go into negative territory. Year to date, despite all the new supply, uh, which is, like I said, not just new inventory, new, a brand new um, properties, but also new inventory onto existing stock, a really, really strong base, 84.5% down margin in last year, over 145 euros average rate, and 122 euros, 54 cent on rev price, down about two and a half percent. So in my opinion, a really strong place for Dublin to be in given all the new supply coming in and significant more supply due to still enter the market for the last um, month of the last couple of weeks this year and into 2020. Look at compression for a moment then. Year to October, you're looking here at four quadrants. The first quadrant is less than 70% occupancy working from left to right. The second quadrant, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, and 90% and above. Green is year state 17, yellow is year state 18, blue is year state 19, and the orange dots represent the average rate achieved on those particular nights. So if we interpret one, for example, we had 36 nights in 2019 so far when occupancy in Dublin was less than 70%. Um, that increased in the 70 to 80%, that increased year over year. So we're looking at 57 nights. That went up quite significantly to 107 nights in 2019. Um, in 2019 for the 8 to 90% bucket. What we have seen though is that last quadrant where we've seen a decline in the number of nights where the city is highly compressed. And we define highly compressed as has um, occupancy 90% or above. So if you look at that compared to 2017, it's down about 22%. That perforated line through the screen, when the city is less compressed, so the less, um, less, uh, less than 70% occupancy, Average rate sits somewhere around 112 euros. Compared to the nights when the city is highly compressed, it sits close to 165 euros. That's, that's that magic 48% number. So as the city becomes more occupied, yielding to the tune of 48% is taking place. Um, and that's even with um, 21 less high compression nights this year versus um, last year. If we look at just briefly at day a week, um, again, really strong, uh, performance throughout the week so certainly Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday very similar occupancies making up that 84 and a half percent a little bit lower on a Sunday night not unusual to see that this is a full 12 month period from November 2018 right through to October the interesting thing here though is Saturday nights achieve an average rate 23 euros higher than every any given Tuesday or Wednesday any given Tuesday or Wednesday over that 12 month um, time period so we take the average of all the Tuesdays the Wednesdays the Thursdays so on and so forth and of course, your ability to drive rate during the week, given that you have many contracted rates and corporate negotiated rates, is not, um, not the same as your ability to drive rate on Saturday night when you'd have uh, presumably Friday or Saturday night, you have presumably more of the leisure and transient guests coming in. Better or worse than last year, so over the 12 month period, Sunday and Monday is growing to the tune of 2% when you look at rev par, so mainly on the average rate side of things, a little bit over uh, 1.5%. And we're seeing the pressure come in as really on a mixed bag of occupancy and average rate on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it's really the Saturday night where we've seen some decline on um, average rate, although less than 2% on average rate and a clear 2% on uh, rev par. So we touched just briefly on Forward Star. Um, Forward Star is, is a product that we've started rolling out over the last kind of 18 months. Um, we are collecting business in the books demand into the future. Um, please, if any of you on the call want to have more information on it, let me know. Um, our intention is to be able to mirror our star or our historical data with our Forward Star um, offering. Forward Star, we just captured the demand. It's um, rooms you've removed from inventory that are booked. So we very intentionally don't call it confirmed, recognizing that confirmed means different things in different properties, even within the same companies. Zero cost data automation. You can schedule a report, schedule via Opera, News, um, Hotsoft, uh, Fidelio Suite 8, a number of different PMSs. Super simple, and that's just demand. 
We've now launched 19 different markets across Europe and the Middle East, uh, Dublin and Belfast being two, um, and then a number of the London markets, sub-markets, um, and Manchester as well, and uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi about to go live very shortly also. So if we look at what some of that data is telling us, these are the markets that are live currently. I appreciate Dublin is not in the UK, but just to give an average across the UK. So look, if we're, this is um, a couple of weeks old now, but if we're looking at, we were looking at as at the 18th of November, for the next 28 days, what was the future demand for each of these locations? So anything in green is booking the, uh, booking the trend of the average of 56%, anything in red is beyond, is behind that. So um, places like London, really strong demand fundamentally for the, for the preceding tw uh, 28 days, 66% of all inventory booked, 62% um, in Bristol, 69 in Manchester, so Manchester and Edinburgh, toe to toe when it comes to performance, Glasgow the same, Aberdeen a little bit behind, and again I've mentioned that supply impact there um, a couple of times already. If we look then at what that looks like for the next 90 days, so the taller tower blocks, the darker colours of the next 28, the next 90 days are the lower um, tower blocks for the, for the green. So uh, places like Manchester Centre, like I said, almost 70% for the next 28 days, and then sitting just below the 40% mark, 38.5% for the next 90 days. So to give you a feel for kind of what's on the books. If we look at Dublin City Centre, just to kind of show you what we can do with the data, this is just to give an example, it doesn't really matter where it's for. If we were looking 90 days out, you see some of the demand drivers. Liam Gallagher, not sure he's generating all of that demand, uh, which was there the tail end of November. Uh, demand for New Year's Eve was already on the 18th of November, was sitting at, uh, at exactly 75%. And then Six Nations, this is comparing this year versus same time last year, so that grey lines you're seeing through the chart is same time last year. Six Nations, whilst it might look that we're up here, that we're way ahead of where we were last year, of course, the dates change year over year. Um, and the, the um, games that are hosted in Ireland change year over year as well. So Wales um, playing in Ireland for one of the first games of Six Nations in February. We can look a full 365 days out. Uh, you see that, that kind of almost a halfway through the screen, maybe a little bit less than that. You'll see the impact again, comparing where we were last year versus where we are this year. Those some kind of, it looks more like it's March days. It's actually April, it's just a slight shift on the legend. Um, we see that the uh, demand already in the books are heading towards 40% for the 5th anniversary of the World Irish Dancing Championships. And then towards the end of the time series here, you'll see the tail end of, 2000, uh, tail end of, excuse me, of August 19, when um, Dublin will host the Notre Dame Navy game for the college, American football and college, world's, college uh, football as well. So very strong demand sitting there. So um, heading just shy of 60% already, almost uh, nine, nine and a half months out. Just overlay that then a little bit with uh, where we were last year. So this year group is the navy blue. This year transient is that kind of sweet pink. Same time last year is that kind of uh, electric blue line you see going through it. And same time last year transient. So Six Nations, like I mentioned already, 2020 concerts not having as big an impact so far at least, although many more will be announced, I'm sure. We had Westlife in Crow Park last year in July. That obviously won't happen in July 2020 unless they haven't told us anything yet. And then that big peak towards the end is not just the Notre Dame, um, Notre Dame uh, Navy game. It's also a um, World Congress taking place at the Convention Centre in Dublin. So I'm going to leave you with a little bit of pipeline and um, forecast. So if we look at pipeline, like I said, it's one of the key themes that we're seeing across the world this year. Um, if all of this... Uh, pipeline comes to fruition. Some of it will not, some of it will. Some people will change their minds. They may not get the funding from the bank, etc. But if it all comes to fruition, this is what the world will look like in the next zero to five years. So 12% increase in uh, supply in North America, 9% uh, in Europe. They're both big, hefty numbers, 7% in Central and South, 12% in Africa, massive folks in Africa and new supply at the minute. A whopping 49% in the Middle East continues to uh, perform in a kind of bonkers manner, and 16% across Asia Pacific. If we drill that down, then for Europe, the biggest um, contributor to new supply would be in the UK, well, the biggest by comparison of existing supply would be 24% in the UK, that represents 161,000 rings. Germany, 16%, Spain, 5%, Ireland, a whopping 29%, um, so on and so forth as we look down through um, the table of the top 10. 
And if we just look a little bit at forecasts before I get into that, obviously Brexit is on the horizon again. Um, this is just a traveler survey that we did um, at the beginning of this year. So appreciate these numbers are a little, a little old now. We did a survey of 30,000 um, travelers on our panel. Those that are based in continental Europe, 15% said Brexit is affecting their plans to visit the UK in 2019. 32% were actively delaying making travel plans. And 38% said Brexit gave the UK a general negative uh, perception. We asked the same question of the UK residents. 17% said Brexit was affecting their travel plans outbound to the UK and to Europe, and 26% making um, actively making delays to their travel plans. So we look at what we see the future to look like. This is obviously for tail end 19. This is as of um, year to date uh, September data. So Heathrow, Glasgow, Belfast, Dublin, Edinburgh, all under pressure. Most of those under pressure on the back of new supply bedding in. That was made will always be a negative picture, just as that supply, uh, you know, finds its place in the marketplace. Edinburgh more on the um, slowdown in some of the conferences as well as new supply. And then some of the markets we expect to see some growth in to the tail end of uh, 19. Birmingham nominal, Manchester a little bit, Gatwick a little, Leeds and London the, the best performers, although all less than five percent. And then a little bit further out into 2020. Slightly more positive picture. Dublin will we'll expect to still see some declines into 2020, although an adjustment then in Heathrow, Glasgow, London, Belfast, Gatwick, and Birmingham um, as we look at full year 2020. Some key takeaways: um, travel demand are the fundamentals are really strong. We continue to see um, you know more people traveling. We continue to see increases in traveler arri arrivals, regardless of what location you're looking at. Um, performance is currently challenging for many. Supply is on the up, an um, understatement of the, the, the last 45 minutes. And Brexit will impact demand. The question is how much and for how long. The short-term outlook is a little tough. It's tougher for, for some uh, more than others, but the long-term outlook remains strong and uh, demand fundamentals remain strong in the future. So I think uh, that's my lot, Adrian. Sarah, that has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, but before um, we let you go, um, I've got a little milk a little bit more of your time and ask you um, a couple of questions. You're obviously very active in the industry. I, I actually don't know anyone as active in the industry as you are. So I think, you know, you're a great sense of knowledge for what's going on. 2020, just around the corner, do you have any personal predictions um, that you think is that we need to look out for or actually even on the other side of that, any threats that you think we need to um, look out for, you know, sort of the good stuff and the bad stuff that you think might happen next year? Yeah, I think it depends where you are. Um, political uncertainty is definitely one of them. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the Brexit piece. Certainly for the UK, um, the strength and or weakness of the pound is going to be a big consideration. Um, how or if Brexit plays out and whether it's a crashing out or a more gentle um, pirouette, I think is how I've been describing it, pirouette out of, out of the EU will have a massive impact. Um, I've said this before at various different, if you think of the Irish hotels, I'd be very careful about putting my eggs into all one basket when it comes to a particular nationality, whether you're the biggest source market for Ireland is still the UK, although it's significantly down in previous years, but that has been underpinned the last two, maybe three years by US and North America visitors generally. Um, that's definitely going to soften next year. So that's, I think that's a big threat for Ireland because uh, we haven't really seen that. That's, you know, the, the slowdown in UK visitors have been underpinned by the US. Uh, some of the new supply is required across the board, across regional UK, across the UK, across the Spains, the Germanys, the Italys. Um, I'd be careful about where we're putting that new supply, that we don't try and put that all into one particular part of any given city, just because it's popular at this point in time. I mean, going back to the Dublin piece, Liberties was someone you'd never go, certainly when I lived in Dublin for nine years, um, you wouldn't go when I lived there 15 years ago. Um, and now it's, it's, you know, it's turned into a real trendy, trendy part of the world. Um, airlift I think is a big one for all locations across Europe uh, if we can continue to make you know continue to have flying affordable um, and I don't mean just the Ryanairs or the EasyJets of this world you know you have the Norwegians heading out to the States and places like that as well that will certainly help to drive demand and 
and definitely looking, uh, I don't know if any of you follow Noel Gibbons on LinkedIn uh, from Tourism Ireland, but definitely looking more at how we can drive to more demand, inbound demand from the likes of Asia and the Middle East. Um, there's a whole swathe of Indians, Chinese, Singaporeans, Malaysians, not to mention Emiratis, Omanis, etc., um, that have probably never visited Europe or certainly never visited anywhere beyond London and Paris. So a big opportunity there. I think that's, that's my ramble about that, Adrian. Oh, well, listen, Sarah, thank you so much. And to everyone who has taken part today, Sarah has very kindly uh, said that we can share her slides. So um, after this event, um, obviously I have your emails on registration and um, I'll send those out to you, which is great, Sarah. Thank you so much for that. The meeting also has been recorded, so we're going to put that on social media. So if any of you would like to share that or listen to it again, um, it will be accessible on um, LinkedIn and on our website um, in the next couple of hours. Um, but Sarah, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. We're absolutely privileged to have you take part in this webinar. Um, so thank you so much for giving up your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and just really happy Christmas, everyone. Um, hope you all have a lovely um, holiday, get some well-deserved time off, and hopefully we can pick up in our next webinar in January. But thanks again, Sarah, you're a star. I owe you. Thank you. No worries, Adrian. You're more than welcome. Happy Christmas, everyone. Thanks, Adrian. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.